actually do to prevent such attacks? Around 30 people from the UK are thought to have died. 18 British victims have now been formally identified. Among them, 24-year-old Carly Lovett from Lincolnshire, a beauty blogger and photographer who'd only recently got engaged. One family lost three generations. Adrian Evans, his father Patrick, and his nephew Joel Richards were dedicated Walsall football supporters. This morning, fellow Saddlers fans and friends paid tribute outside the ground. Sue Davey was on holiday with her partner, Scott Chalky. They were both killed. This afternoon, Sue's son, Connor Fulford, spoke to our correspondent, Sean Lloyd. This was the scene outside Lancashire County Council today after campaigners learnt that an application to start fracking for shale gas had been rejected. The energy firm behind it, Quadrilla, said it was surprised and disappointed by the decision. The application for a site in Little Plumpton near Blackpool was rejected on the grounds of noise and the impact on the landscape. Our correspondent Ed Thomas is there for us now. Ed. Now, should shops be allowed to open for longer on Sundays? The government thinks they should, and it's about to unveil new proposals for England and Wales to allow that to happen. Current laws allow smaller shops to open all day, but large stores can only open their doors for a maximum of six hours. In his budget tomorrow, the Chancellor will give elected mayors and councils powers to decide what's right for their area. Our correspondent John Kay has been gauging reaction in Bristol, and he joins us now. John. Barclays Bank has fired its chief executive, Anthony Jenkins, after less than three years in charge. It's understood that the board thought the pace of cost-cutting was too slow and that the bank's investment arm wasn't performing well enough. Mr Jenkins is being replaced temporarily by the bank's new chairman. Here's our business editor, Kamal Ahmed. Good evening and welcome to the BBC News at 6. A former SS guard at the Nazi death camp Auschwitz has been found guilty of facilitating the murder of 300,000 people. 94-year-old Oskar Gröning was known as the bookkeeper of Auschwitz. His job was to count the money confiscated from prisoners as they arrived at the camp. A court in Germany sentenced him to four years in prison at the end of what's expected to be one of the last Holocaust trials. While our correspondent Caroline Wyatt is in Lüneburg where his trial took place. Caroline. Now, caught on camera by an unmanned NASA spacecraft that's travelled three billion miles to get there, this is the most detailed image ever seen of the planet Pluto. And there were celebrations at Mission Control this morning when the spacecraft sent a message to Earth telling scientists that it had survived its close encounter with the dwarf planet. Now scientists are waiting for even more detailed images of the last truly unexplored world in the solar system. Our science editor, David Shookman, is at Mission Control in Maryland. David. Good evening. Confidential letters written by Prince Charles to Tony Blair and his ministers when Labour were in government have been published after a 10-year legal battle by the Guardian newspaper. The letters to seven government departments cover a wide range of subjects, including badger culling and herbal medicine. In one letter to the Prime Minister, Prince Charles said the armed forces were being asked to do a challenging job without the necessary resources. Clarence House says publishing the letters will only inhibit the Prince's ability to express concerns. Here's our Royal Correspondent, Nicholas Witchell. The number of people out of work in the UK has fallen again. The jobless total is down 35,000 and now stands at 1.83 million people, the lowest figure for seven years. It means that 5.5% of the UK's working population are out of work. Average wages, excluding bonuses, were up 2.2%. But the good news was tempered by a more pessimistic outlook from the Bank of England, which cut its forecasts for economic growth, wages and productivity. Here's our economics editor, Robert Peston. Introduced greater powers to tackle extremism, saying that Britain has been a passively tolerant society for too long. The Prime Minister says a new counter-extremism bill will be in the Queen's speech later this month. The measures include banning orders against individuals and groups that promote extremist views which undermine British values. Tonight we have a special report on the man many believe prompted the government's action. Here's our security correspondent Gordon Carrera. 
In Nepal, hundreds of thousands of people have spent another night out in the open after the second major earthquake in less than three weeks. 76 people are known to have died yesterday, but that figure is expected to rise. The latest earthquake centered on several districts in the foothills of the Himalayas, the town of Chutara, where several people have been killed, was already a hub for rescuers and for aid after the first earthquake. Our South Asia correspondent Justin Rolat is there. Attempted military coup is underway in Burundi. There has been heavy gunfire in the capital, Bujumbura, and at least 50,000 civilians have fled the small landlocked country. The East African nation was affected by the overspill of the Rwandan genocide in 1994, but also had its own civil war in which more than 300,000 people were killed. Since then, it has had a decade of relative calm, but the latest protests were sparked by the president's decision to seek a third term in office. It triggered both violence and international condemnation. Maud Julien is in the capital of Bujumbura. Her report contains some images you may find distressing. Claudia Winkleman has spoken for the first time about the night her eight-year-old daughter's Halloween costume caught fire. She sustained serious burns and spent some time in hospital. Claudia Winkleman decided to tell her story to the BBC's Watchdog programme to warn parents of the dangers of cheap dressing up clothes. Here's David Silito. Good evening. Twelve members of the same family from Bradford are missing after they failed to return from a pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. The three sisters and their nine children, aged between three and 15, were supposed to fly home four days ago. A lawyer representing the women's husbands says the most pro pro probable of the possibilities is that they have travelled to Syria to join Islamic State. Our special correspondent Lucy Manning reports. Joining Islamic extremists, the mother of a 25-year-old British man killed last night in Kenya fighting for al-Shabaab has told the BBC that her world fell apart when she heard the news. In an exclusive interview, Sally Evans says she had not heard from her son Thomas, who converted to Islam since December, and she spoke of her anger at members of the local community who she blames for radicalizing him. Here's our security correspondent, Gordon Carrera fled fighting in the north of the country as Islamic State fighters struggled to hold a key town on the border with Turkey. It's the latest in a series of setbacks for the jihadis in northern Syria. Kurdish forces, supported by U.S. airstrikes, closed in on the town of Tal Abiyad from the west and east, cutting off a vital supply line to the extremist stronghold of Raqqa. The latest reports from the Kurdish forces claim they have now taken the key border town. Our correspondent Paul Wood sent this report from the border. His father and his brother were both presidents of the United States. Now the former Florida governor, Jeb Bush, is hoping to follow in their footsteps. Tonight he's launched his bid to become the Republican Party's presidential candidate, but he's up against at least 10 other hopefuls. A history of Magna Carta, a founding document of Western democracy, has been celebrated by the Queen and thousands of guests beside the River Thames in Surrey. It originated as a peace treaty between King John and his barons. He sealed it in 1215 at Runnymede, where today's ceremony took place. Magna Carta reigned in the powers of the monarch, stating that they, like everyone else, were subject to the rule of law. It's widely recognized as the first charter protecting human rights and freedoms. Our royal correspondent, Nicholas Witchell, was at the ceremony and sent this report. Good evening. Thousands of holidaymakers are leaving Tunisia after the British government warned that another terror attack is highly likely. The Foreign Secretary, Philip Hammond, said the government now had a better picture of the emerging scale of the threat and it was too big a risk for Britons to stay in the country. It comes two weeks after a gunman killed 38 tourists in Seuss, most of them British. Denmark and Ireland have now also advised their citizens to leave. Our correspondent, Ola Girin, is in Tunisia for us now. Ola. Seventy-five years ago today, the RAF launched attacks against German fighter aircraft off the English coast. It was the beginning of what became known as the Battle of Britain, the first significant Allied victory against the Nazis. Today, spitfires and hurricanes flew over Buckingham Palace to mark the anniversary. The Queen and other members of the royal family watched on from the balcony, as Nick Heim reports. At the G7 summit in Germany, world leaders are meeting for the second and final day. On the agenda, climate change and the fight against international terrorism. Our Berlin correspondent Jenny Hill is in Schloss Elmer for us now. Jenny.
Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. HSBC says it's cutting 8,000 jobs in the UK as part of its strategy to reduce costs and simplify the business. It's also going to scrap the HSBC brand on the high street, though it hasn't yet decided on a new name. The bank, Europe's biggest, says it needs to save more than £3 billion in costs within two years. Here's our business correspondent, Emma Simpson. People in Wales could soon be banned from using e-cigarettes in enclosed public places like restaurants, pubs and at work. The new public health law would make Wales the first part of the UK to ban them. But the proposals, which would come into force in 2017, have divided opinion. Britain's largest cancer charity says there's no scientific evidence to support the policy and it could actually undermine efforts to give up tobacco. Our Wales correspondent, Hal Griffith, is in Cardiff. Hal. Now, he's one of the UK's best-known writers and illustrators. And this morning, Chris Riddell was named as the ninth children's laureate, following in the footsteps of Michael Morpurgo, Jacqueline Wilson and Quentin Blake. This is one of his most famous creations, The Ghost of a Mouse. He says he hopes to use his two years to lead people into the wonderful world of books and reading. Daniela Ralph reports. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. Police in the United States are searching for a white gunman who shot dead nine people, three men and six women, at an African-American church in Charleston, South Carolina. Police say the killer had spent an hour in the church at a prayer meeting before opening fire. Detectives say they're treating the attack as a hate crime and they've warned people not to approach the suspect, who's in his 20s. Richard Galpin reports. The Prince of Wales and the Prime Minister have attended a memorial service at St Paul's Cathedral to mark the 200th anniversary of the Battle of Waterloo. The battle was a decisive victory for an army of British, Dutch and Prussian troops against the forces of the French Emperor Napoleon. Tens of thousands of troops were killed or wounded in the battle, which settled the balance of power in Europe for a century. Well, Robert Hall is on the battlefields of Waterloo in Belgium. Robert that essential repair work on the Palace of Westminster could cost around £7 billion unless MPs move out for as long as six years. That's according to a report into the state of repair of the palace, which is partly sinking and has asbestos and outdated cabling. Our political correspondent Chris Mason reports. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. The future of Greece is hanging in the balance after the country overwhelmingly rejected the terms of an international bailout package. Eurozone leaders are considering their response to the referendum in which 61% of Greeks voted no. A summit is due to be held tomorrow in Brussels to discuss the crisis. Queues have formed once again at banks which are expected to run out of cash in just a few days. Here, David Cameron held an emergency meeting with the Chancellor and Governor of the Bank of England. Chris Morris reports from Athens. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. After 17 hours of talks in Brussels, Eurozone leaders have reached an agreement to keep Greece in the Euro. They are offering a third bailout in return for tough new reforms that have to become law in Greece by Wednesday. The cost of the bailout is huge, £61 billion. But so too is the price the Greeks are now paying. They face years of even more and tougher austerity. The German Chancellor Angela Merkel said the road ahead would be long and arduous. Well, Tim Wilcox is in Athens for us now, Tim. A number of flights at Heathrow were cancelled or delayed this morning after a group of protesters cut through a perimeter fence and chained themselves together on a runway. They were campaigning against the possible expansion of Britain's biggest airport. The runway was closed for nearly three hours. Well, Andy Moore is at Heathrow for us now. Andy. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. The Greek Parliament must agree to reforms demanded by the Eurozone by tonight in order to secure another bailout. MPs will vote on the terms of the deal later today, but the vote comes amid fierce criticism from the International Monetary Fund. It says that even if Athens carries out the full austerity program being demanded, it still won't be able to pay back tens of billions of euros to its creditors. Our correspondent Mark Lowen is in Athens for us now, Mark. 
A former SS officer known as the bookkeeper of Auschwitz has been found guilty of facilitating mass murder. A German court sentenced Oskar Gröning, who is 19.